Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Bob Gosling. I currently serve as a volunteer with UC Davis Thrombosis and Hemostasis Center after my retirement in 2017 from the university health system as a senior clinical laboratory scientist in special coagulation. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Direct Oral Anticoagulants, Impact and Interference of DOACs on Coagulation Testing. This program was created with Dr. Dot Adcock, the Chief Medical Officer and Senior Vice President of LabCorp Diagnostics. This session is a combined effort between the American Association for Clinical Chemistry and the North American Specialized Coagulation Laboratory Association. In the previous sessions, we provided an overview of DOACs, which include dabigatran, a direct thrombin inhibitor, and the direct anti tenate DOACs, which include apixaban, batrixaban, edoxaban, and rivaroxaban. We previously described their performance characteristics, including pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, using screening or specific coagulation assays. The new consideration as DOACs target specific activated factors, the impact of these drugs on other coagulation assays are likely leading to potential erroneous interpretation and mismanagement. As we previously demonstrated that DOACs may affect clot-based assays such as the PT and APTT, but will these observations translate to other clot-based coagulation assays? Will DOACs also affect non-clot-based assays such as immunoassays? As trough levels represent the lowest DOAC concentration of the patient, will trough collections mitigate any DOAC interference? And lastly, are there any alternative strategies for testing in the presence of DOACs? This slide represents a review of clot-based coagulation testing, including the screening test PTINR and APTT, factor assays, thrombophilia testing, and other routine or esoteric assays. In prior pearls, we have extensively described the DOAC effect on screening tests such as the PT and APTT. As DOACs are inhibitors of activated coagulation factors, PT and or APTT mixing studies may mimic an inhibitor pattern. In this session, we will describe a general overview of the effect of DOACs on more esoteric coagulation assays. The one-stage assay is the most common method used for determining factor activity. Factor deficient plasma is added to dilute patient sample then either a PT or a PTT is run in order to obtain a corresponding clot time. The clot time is inversely proportional to factor activity, so the shorter the clotting time, the higher the factor activity. A calibration curve with a standard of known factor activity will provide a relationship between factor activity and clot times. The factor activity of an unknown or patient sample is extrapolated from the calibration curve based on the clot times obtained. As DOACs may increase PT or APT clot times, this will result in a factitiously low factor activity, as noted with increasing concentrations of dubicotran and reported factor two and factor eight activity. So caution must be exercised when performing factor activity testing in DOAC treated patients, as this may lead to misdiagnosis and potential mismanagement. This caution also applies to clot-based inhibitor assays, such as the Bethesda assay, which may suggest the presence of a factor inhibitor. Fibrinogen and thrombin time are similar assays in that thrombin is added to the patient sample, where the difference between the two assays is the sample preparation and thrombin concentration. As thrombin is a test reagent, the Bigotran, the direct thrombin inhibitor, will prolong clotting time and result in falsely depressed fibrinogen levels and prolong thrombin time. Direct factor 10A DOACs will not affect either test. The factitiously low fibrinogen levels are dependent on the dabigatran concentration and the testing protocol, including sample dilution and thrombin concentration. Clot-based protein C assays use a snake venom, Protac, from the copperhead snake, Ascrodonctin contortix, contortix. Protac will activate the protein C in the plasma, creating an activated protein C, which inhibits activated factors five and eight. As activated five and eight are inhibited, the clotting time is prolonged. The prolongation is proportional to the amount of protein T present in the plasma. 
protein C deficient plasma is added to the test sample to isolate clot time prolongation is only due to protein C. However, DOHAX may increase the APTT clotting time, thus falsely elevating protein C results. There is a variable DOAC dose-dependent effect on clottable protein C methods, resulting in factitiously elevated protein C levels. Alternatively, chromogenic protein C methods are not affected by either class of DOACs. As demonstrated, no effect of either dabigatran or rivaroxaban on chromogenic protein C results. While the clot-based protein C assays described here is the most common, there are other reagent platforms using prothrombin time or Russell's Viper Venom time reagents. The DOAC effect on these methods have not been adequately described, but may be vetted with external quality assurance samples provided by CAP or ECAT. Immunologic methods for protein C are not affected by DOAC presence. Protein S is a cofactor to activated protein C and clot-based protein S testing uses this principle for testing. Protein S deficient plasma is added to test sample to isolate clot time prolongation is only due to protein S. Activated protein C is then added to the sample, creating activated protein S, which will inhibit factor 5A, which is either provided as a reagent source or through snake venom activation of factor 10, which will subsequently activate factor 5. The factor 5A inhibition by protein S is proportional to the prolongation of the clotting time. DOAX will increase the clotting time, thereby falsely increasing reportable protein S activity using clot-based methods. As noted with protein C, there is variation between DOAX, but all will potentially yield falsely elevated protein S activity. Alternatively, free protein S using latex immunoassay methods is not affected by DOAX, as demonstrated with dabigatran in this figure. While the clot-based functional protein S assay described here is the most common, there are other reagent platforms using prothrombin time or Russell's Viper Venom time reagents. As with the alternative protein C assays, the DOAC effect on these protein S methods have not been well described in detail, but may be vetted in the future using external quality assurance programs such as CAP or ECAT. Activated protein C resistance is a screening test for factor V gene mutation that result in resistance and neutralization of factor V-A by activated protein C. This assay is a modified APTT with one step using standard APTT reagents or method, the second step using a calcium reagent supplemented with activated protein C. As DOAX will increase clotting times of the APTT, false negative ratios may be obtained, as noted in samples with increasing concentration of DOAX. Additionally, false positive activated protein C ratios have also been reported. Alternatively, genetic testing for factor V lighting can be performed, but this may miss unusual activated protein C mutations, such as 5 Cambridge or 5 Hong Kong. For lupus anticoagulant testing, although there are several methods available, there are two primary testing principles, the dilute Russell's Viper Venom Time, or DRVVT, and the hexagonal phase method. For the DRVVT, the venom from Russell's Viper activates factor 10 in a low phospholipid concentration reagent. If prolonged, a repeat DRVVT in a high phospholipid concentration reagent is tested and the ratio between the two results would suggest the presence or absence of a lupus anticoagulant. With hexagonal phase method, a modified PTT with and without phosphatidyl ethanolamine is measured and the result difference between the two tests exceeds eight seconds, then a lupus anticoagulant is present. With DRVVT methods, DOAX may increase clotting times, thus falsely indicating a lupus anticoagulant which increases with increasing DOAC concentration. Anti-10A DOACs do not interfere with hexagonal phase testing, but the bigger trend has been demonstrated to cause false positive results at higher concentrations. As noted in this figure, with exceeding the eight second different threshold for hexagonal phase testing at approximately 200 nanograms per ml of the bigger trend. As a note, because of the linear relationship seen between DRVVT tests and DOAC concentration, 
This method has been proposed as a means of quantifying DOAX. The concern, however, is that the lower concentration of DOAX in this sample being rivaroxaban, and perhaps the lower limit of quantitation may not be sufficiently adequate. Chromogenic methods are typically two-stage assays, where the sample is mixed with activator in the first stage, and then the addition of a specific substrate for the second stage. This cartoon depicts the antithrombin assay, where the antithrombin in the patient sample complexes with excess factor 10A in the presence of heparin, resulting in a bound complex post residual factor 10A. A specific substrate is then added, which binds to the residual factor 10A and cleaves a peptide resulting in yellow color production. For this particular chromogenic assay, the yellow color production is inversely proportional to antithrombin present. Of particular note for DOAX is some antithrombin methods use excess thrombin instead of factor 10A, but the principle is still the same with excess thrombin cleaving specific substrate result in yellow color production. In this figure, the effect of anti-10A DOACs demonstrate the falsely increased reported antithrombin activity with increasing drug concentration using the factor 10A reagent method. Note that the dabigatran does not affect the factor 10A method. If the reagent were thrombin based, then the representation would be reversed where the dabigatran samples would show falsely increased levels with increasing drug concentration and no effect by the anti-10A DOACs. This table lists the common chromogenic assays that are available. There is no uniform effect, so clinicians and laboratory personnel should be aware of potential DOAC interference prior to result reporting. However, as laboratories tend to have the greater knowledge about technical issues related to testing, they should take the lead role in providing information to clinicians about DOAC interference on coagulation assays and provide recommendations for alternative tests or methods. So test methods that are not affected by DOAX include latex immunoassays, ELISA based methods, agglutination methods, or most platelet function testing. Esoteric tests that may be affected by DOAX include thrombin based platelet aggregation, thrombin activated fibrinolytic lysis inhibitor, or TAFI, and these drugs may alter assays that assess fibrinolysis. In a previous publication, we demonstrated that estimated DOAC concentration that result in a greater 15% difference from baseline. The columns represent the specific DOAC with expected trough levels. For dabigatran, for apixaban, for batrixaban, for adoxaban, and for rivaroxaban. Note that these assays were affected by low DOAC concentrations that may be expected for trough concentrations. As such, merely collecting trough samples may not be sufficient to avoid factitious results due to DOAC interference. The LA testing reported here is for the dilute Russell's Viper Venom method, with the final ratio reporting be less affected by DOAC presence than the screening confirmation methods. These data reflect method and reagent dependence. So minimizing DOAC interference. Select tests that are not affected by DOACs would be the optimal solution. However, there are some in vitro neutralizing agents such as activated charcoal or filters that are commercially available. However, notes of caution is that none of these products are currently FDA approved. These products are also not interchangeable some of these products induce some degree of coagulation, and there's a variable degree of plasma recovery after using the neutralizing products. So in summary about DOAX and interference coagulation testing, the question would be, are clot-based methods are affected by DOAX? And this is a mostly true statement. Next, non-clot-based methods are not affected by DOAX. This is also mostly a true statement, but chromogenic methods may be affected depending on substrates. Will collection of trough samples be sufficient to mitigate any DOAC interference? This is cautiously false, as this will be method dependent. Lastly, alternative strategies for testing while on DOAX. You know, consider alternative methods or use DOAC neutralizing techniques.
and I want to thank you for joining me on this Pearl Laboratory Medicine Impact and Interference of Dovax and Coagulation Testing. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.